Okay, it looks like we're recording. So everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your resident Dubai crypto blockchain and tech attorney. Maybe soon I'll be a artificial intelligence attorney, given the way that this show is going. And I would like to invite my new friend, uh, Pavel Czech, onto the show. Pavel and I met maybe a few weeks ago because a mutual friend and business partner of ours, Ian Arden, uh, organizes some very nice lunches. And Pablo was in town. We, we talked. He's very impressive. They're collaborating. Uh, then I met them for breakfast shortly thereafter and was impressed. Um, Pablo was off in Saudi Arabia for leap, but at least, you know, thank God Zoom is geography free. So, Pablo, I know you're really busy. I know you're jumping around. So thank you for coming on the show. We're, I'm happy to have you. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for inviting me. And thank you for the kind words. Uh, yes, it was amazing to interact with you uh, at the breakfast, and thank you for that invitation. And Ian, thanks for the lunches. Um, I think it's just um, people that have exciting ideas tend to gravitate towards each other regardless. So I think that we we just have very exciting ideas, sometimes opposing views, not always agreeing. That's but, true, we'll, uh, and we'll get into those. We'll get into those as well, but uh, it's, I think the discourse uh, itself is the quality uh, that we're after. Yeah. So I'm very excited to join the show and have that conversation again with you. Indeed. Okay. So we're going to be talking about new native. We're going to be talking about Saudi Arabia. We're going to be talking about AI. We're going to be talking about your accelerator slash incubator. We're going to get into all that, but I always like to get a little bit of background. So where are you from? Um, so I'm Polish, right? Mm -hmm. uh, although my surname is Czech, like mm -hmm. the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. So literally, for, it's literally uh, Czech. It is literally Czech. Right. So uh, for those of you uh, watching us at home, it's like Johnny USA. Yeah. So yes. you can basically uh, think about like that. I was born in Poland. Uh, I, I have uh, a family here. I have two sons, a seven year old and a 14 year old. Mm -hmm. And me and my wife, we have three dogs as well, which is, uh, I think, you know, uh, two dogs too many, but that's what we have. Uh, we're, we're already going to disagree because I love dogs, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I think just, just one dog is enough looking at okay. the free dog comp composition. Um, so we, we, we live here, but we travel all around the world. We've lived in various places around the world, Singapore, United, uh, United States. And uh, we, we are now in Europe, but we're constantly thinking, okay, um, how to uh, expose our family to experiences that are unique, right? whether that would be moving to Abu Dhabi or moving to California, I think they're equally valuable for different reasons, right? Well, um, I'm from California and I suggest going to Abu Dhabi, but for what it's worth. <laughs> you can visit For California. what it's worth, <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, so um, I went to university here. I have a master's degree in uh, economy and uh, management and finance. I also uh, mastered in law. I, I didn't complete my law degree. Uh, because I uh, started full-time um, uh, corporate uh, corporate work uh, mm -hmm. very early on in my career. Um, I studied and I specialized in econometrics. So this is the study of um, the use of mathematics to predict um, outcomes of uncertain equations. Yeah? Okay. So you have multiple equations and the outcome is not 100% predictable, right? So they're differential. And uh, you can approximate the outcome using statistics and economic data. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it means is that for people that have the right data set, they can almost predict the future. So that's what I specialized in. Uh, and that's what I still do. I try to predict the future with uncompleted uh, un, um, uh, data sets, if you wish. That's a fascinating description that I haven't heard you use yet. So you got you got incomplete data. You have a pretty useful set of tools that you were exposed to in school. And here you are in 2024, in a way, you know, re recycling, repurposing, and probably updating these tools for, for the, the present. Um, I mean, of course, I, I've been using this tool set for all my career. So my whole background was always in designing these models. Mm -hmm. that have so-called busy systems, right? So systems that have multiple variables mm -hmm. and to be able to approximate how introducing uh, a new component of the equation will impact the whole system, right? Yes. So I did that for many years in the education industry 
I worked in a large media conglomerate that was publicly listed from Finland. And I specialized in digital transformation for the education systems on a government level and a big media company level. Uh, overall, I spent about eight years doing that. And the projects I participated in and then eventually led, I was the leader of that whole division for two and a half years. Uh, we impacted about 250 million individual students through the uh, various projects. So that's why, like, uh, why I'm talking about this is because one of my core values as an individual was always if we can educate the world, right? Mm -hmm. If we can give everybody access to high quality of education, then we can really try to solve big problems collectively um, and bring everybody uh, to a level where uh, we can um, we can expect a better outcome, a better future, right? Um, so, that's optimistic, but I like it. Okay. I mean, that's my approach to it, right? The math, the math makes sense around this. So if everybody uh, in the world would be educated in basic STEM uh, subjects to a slightly higher level than they are right now, we would have a higher participation of engineers, of scientists, of uh, people that sure. know how to systemically solve problems. Therefore, we would, uh, I believe, move up uh, in the civilization ladder. Faster and better. Faster, yes. Yeah. Faster, yeah. better, accelerated. Let me, let me go off script a little bit and share a personal feeling or observation with you. Because I, I think it, I think it's interesting that you're trying to manage, accelerate, and, and arrive the future through econometrics and the way you're describing. It. So I'm, you know, I, I was born in the late '60s. I won't give my exact date, but I, you know, I grew up on science fiction. I grew up on Star Trek. I grew up on Ray Bradbury. I grew up on all this stuff. And I, if you had told me by the year 2020 we weren't already having colonies on Mars and flying cars and robots. I would laugh at you. I'm like, you know, but that's that, that stuff's gonna be all handled by 2000. By by 2024, we're going to be off to Jupiter already, and mm -hmm. it was a big, painful thing that I was going through. I guess from 19, with the exception of the internet, which is cool, from from the mid 90s to the mid 2010s, late 2010s, I got the extremely strong feeling that humanity was stalling out. You know, planes weren't getting any faster. Buildings were looking the same. You know, all, all the innovation seemed to be happening on screens, not in our physical environment. So, our you know, it's not like clothing was changing. You know, medicine a little bit with biotech, but it wasn't like it wasn't like uh. And you know, it's just like you know, a better chat experience, a better social media, a better you know, video experience, a bigger TV. It, it, it was all screens. And then what happened that the past few years is I feel like our physical future is finally arriving with, with robots, with drones, with, you know, AI kind of getting integrated with our general environment. I'm sure that's sort of a screen, but that screen has a voice. It has mobility. It has, it's, it's kind of touching it out into the internet of things and moving around. So I, I feel like the future's finally beginning to show up. You know, I, I feel in a weird way that, you know, the Ukraine war is the future showing up. You know, war's been the same, even Desert Storm with the, with the smart weapons and everything else was kind of a continuation of what happened before. But now I say with the drones and, you know, the way things are evolving, you know, as scary and as awesome as it is, I feel like we're finally getting into the science fiction future I was expecting 20 years ago. And I I think it's interesting that you and I are both operating in the GCC and in, in the Gulf. Where in a weird way the future seems to be arriving faster than in the Europe than in Europe or in the USA, which I would have never guessed as a kid. You know, maybe, maybe Israel would, would pop ahead because it's it's got this brand this high tech nation, but I thought that all these other places were living off the oil money, but they're not. They're 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 plugging ahead, and I just I, I'm going off script. But you know, what's your what's your experience of Saudi? What's your experience of the Middle East, and what's your perspective on this? So, so to address a few things that you said, so. First of all, yeah, I'm totally with you. We should all have the Star Trek doors, yeah? Yeah, yeah. that's... I'm, they should I'm, actually I'm, make I'm that drunk. sound. We should, they should make that sound. The doors should make that sound. And, and that's what we're, we should be aspiring to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I started um, New Native, right? Is to mm -hmm. accelerate innovation 
but to do it in a global way and in a directional way. Mm-hmm. And it direct it connects to what you said. So there was a feeling like we're not solving enough big problems collectively, right? right? There are always individuals that are doing it, like Elon Musk, right? That are driving the innovation forward just for the sheer intellect and will and capacity to execute, right? Mm -hmm. But in my mind, this should be a more inclusive, decentralized collective effort, right? And I think that- Instead of or in addition to? In addition to, in in addition to. Yeah, it's not enough. It's not enough. Right. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's not that it's wrong. It's that we need more, I'd say. We need more. That's right. It's amazing what, what individuals can do. But I think we need more. We should be more um, inclusive and we should think about how to equalize the opportunity for people because there are some amazing minds out there, right? Yes. That we are simply not tapping into the brain power available to us. And... Um, Artificial intelligence is one of the key driving factors that I believe will allow humans to elevate their activity beyond the screen time, right? Because the things that are mundane and boring and screen related will very quickly become automated and no longer valuable, right? Who's going to need a social media manager or social media for that matter? If, if all of the content and all of the replies and everything else will be governed by artificial intelligence. Of course, mm-hmm. consumerism and, and kind of the purchasing of the different services will still remain. But realistically, I believe that it will free up a lot of time mm-hmm. and focus to convert our activity into engineering, into solving really, really big, hard problems and have artificial intelligence as our aid, as the agent that supports our day-to-day activities and then uh, allows us to elevate uh, the level at which uh, we perform as individuals, right? Um, so that that's one of the reasons actually what brought me to Saudi Arabia is that I don't uh, pick and choose where does the innovation come from, mm-hmm. right? I'm not biased towards a specific university or a specific, you know, valley uh, on the on the fault lines of Mm -hmm. of the um, west coast of the U.S. Right? I'm uh, I look at it completely uh, from a dispassionate perspective, and I say, where can we convert um, capital and leverage it to create tangible outcomes Mm -hmm. in the fastest possible way and obviously the natural suspects come to mind like san francisco and new york and london and berlin and we are active in all of them Mm -hmm. but that that also means that we shouldn't put less focus or less attention on innovation that happens in gcc like whether it's dubai or abu dhabi or saudi arabia because i think that's what well, that's one of the biggest challenges that these emerging, um, that some of the emerging markets and, and the aspirational markets, right, like mm-hmm. Saudi, they have that, that problem that people think, well, that's only oil, as you said, yeah, there's, uh, it's, it's not the innovation hub of the world. And it's not the innovation hub of the world because we didn't decide that it should be. It's a decision. It's a conscious um, it's a conscious designed system to bring in high quality talent, to bring in resources, mm-hmm. to bring in ecosystem um, approaches that then create the, the kind of bottom up movement. That's why we started our company and we started a platform where people can use. Yeah, I, I'm going to interrupt for a second because, because I jumped ahead. We skipped a part no, there no, on the lay context no. for the, the show. Let, let, let's talk about your path to new native. So what led mm. up to it? And then let's talk about what it is and its components underneath. And then we'll we'll lead that into Saudi and, and the amazing things you're doing. So sure. what, what, what was it, what, you know, the movie Inception, what was your Inception moment or for new native specifically? Um, looking at research papers that show performance of AI systems in specific um 
group kind of architectures. So specific AI is a very broad field. Yeah. yeah. So uh, computers are stupid in general. Yeah. And we can program them to seem smart. Mm. And the way to program them to seem smart is to invent new mathematical formulas. Yeah. And then to convert these mathematical formulas into code and hope that that code runs faster than the code that was before. Yeah. Okay. So AI is just that code running very, very fast. So think about it like a compression mechanism. Yeah. You don't see the ball moving between the two plates. Yeah. Because it's moving just very, 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 very fast. And that's what AI today is. It's just very, very fast movement of that ball between mm -hmm. the plates and just the plates getting compressed to infinity almost. So the inflection point came when I read the research papers behind transformer architecture, and I understood- that Attention is all you need? Yes, that's right, that's right, yes. That's a great one. I don't fully understand it. You probably understand much more than I do. And even I, was, I read that, I was like, wow. Yes, so, so I read that and I was like, okay, so this means that the performance of AI systems will now drastically increase yeah mm -hmm. so uh, and then what is needed for ai to actually become productionalized or fully i like the word and i i don't know if you will get it but um uh, the horsification of ai yeah think about i understand the word it. horse but I don't, I don't understand what you're meaning so tell me so so think about when the horse was introduced to agriculture mm -hmm how that changed yeah and then a tractor and then a combine yeah mm -hmm. and this is what ai does to compute processing it's a horse it's a combine it's a tractor um, and uh, what i understood was that we will undergo the process of um, industrial revolution grade in compute and in designing and operating software because mm. of just the raw power of the systems yeah but that comes in combination with the drop of energy prices mm. and the drop of cost of compute and therefore the cost of training these models and operating these models yeah so when you start to overlap these two big macroeconomical components and um, for me it, it became very clear that uh, humanity will um, undergo a drastic change in a timeline that we've never seen before. And that's what prompted me to start a company that will benefit from this change. That's epic. And when was this? Uh, this was about uh, three years ago and uh, or two and a half. And the company was actually started in uh, 2022, early 2022. So like two years ago. Okay. And, and, and we're talking about New Native, yes? Yeah, 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 that's right, yes. Okay, and where did you form New Native? So we originally had a small team working out of Sweden and Poland, mm -hmm. and we registered in the US uh, like a standard uh, registration. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, started by inviting and, people. And, and I'm sorry, is it a company or is it a fund? I wasn't quite clear. For it's what, a, what it's a company. It's okay. a company. It's a, it's a it's a software company. New Native is a software company. Got it. We we build software. Okay. And and right from the get go, the the focus was AI. Correct. Right from the get go, there was only one focus, and there was the master plan to become the main meta platform for uh, people to build with artificial intelligence. Yeah. So it awesome. was. It's it, it's it's not a. The vision, the end game, has always been the same. We can be flexible on the details. We can iterate on uh, product market fit for access for individual users. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the plan to own a proportion of all transactions that happen in the world that are um, using artificial intelligence as equity, as talent, as compute, as API calls, as um, uh, consumption of cloud resources, yes, mm -hmm. uh, and revenue. That was always the plan to be the the a meta platform for artificial intelligence. That's great. Now, wh 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 where's the meta in the meta? <laughs> so, the meta in the meta is that you are the uh, system that's underneath. Yeah. So uh, it's the 
it's when the internet came along, right? Mm -hmm. And people started to build infrastructure companies, yeah? Um, then you had the first application layer companies like um, Google, like uh, um, Yahoo, AltaVista, Oracle. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's the idea to build a, to build one of the biggest companies in the world, uh, and that's the actual aspiration. I can be very upfront about it because I, I, I have no shame about that. Is we want to build one of the biggest companies in the world, and the goal for this company is to uh, own um some of the market as a whole yeah so everything that happens in the ai market mm -hmm. got it okay in interesting now we'll, we'll talk about starting in a second but you have a lot of offshoots or programs or things underneath it lab lab and gaia and explain how these pieces fit together and what they're doing sure so we um we work under this premise that um there's a very short timeline when the window of opportunity is open in this industry. Mm. And we started a number of initiatives that slot in together. Yeah. So they create a funnel. Think about it as an acquisition funnel or a funnel of conversion. Right. Yes. So we started by inviting people to build during hackathons. And that's the lablab.ai platform. Right. So okay. lab squared. So this is where we invite people to join together in teams and give them access in many cases to pre-market technologies. And we experiment together with them on how to create um, functioning pieces of software uh, with full business ideas, with product go-to-market ideas in as short as uh, 48 hours, right? So people come in. It's true and hackathon. A true hackathon that is completely online. We have some physical ones, but that's for kind of uh, for the atmosphere mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, but we uh, invited people to build. We opened the doors on the 23rd of June, 2022. Mm -hmm. And until today, we have 112,000 people that joined us. 112,000. Yes. All people. Yes. Yes. It's, it's amazing growth. It's amazing traction. So we have people that come to our door, yeah, to mm -hmm. meet other like-minded people and create um, uh, products together. They're all very technical. Um, they have a background in building software or building products. They have domain uh, do, um, subject um, do, subject domain expertise, yeah. So they're doctors, but they're also developers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they come together. Uh, we uh, help them uh, to find people that are, that are interesting for them. Uh, we match make their uh, teams. And uh, in the last 18 months, they built 2,100 products uh, on the platform. Nice. So th th those are completed projects on the lablab.ai or from the lablab.ai hackathon program. Correct. Yes. Okay. And at the same time, um, we opened initiatives to show the way forward, yeah, to be the kind of leading the way, right? So we said, okay, you want to continue to build? We'll invite you uh, deeper in. We'll give you resources. We'll give you access to compute. We'll give you mm -hmm. access to uh, partners, to AI labs, to specialists, mentors, and come and build your idea into a product, right? Um, and this is how we were invited by the Saudi um, officials, by NTDP and Sadaya, mm -hmm. to physically um, put some of these projects that are created on a global level to put them physically in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Great. And, and, and is the and this incubation slash accelerator? It has a name. It's called Gaia. So Gaia. The, the program. So the the. It's a, the, the brand name is Gaia. It's a partnership between Unative and NTDP and Sadaya mm -hmm. with a goal to establish 300, yes, 300 uh, AI startups in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 36 months. And in the first um, eight months or six months of operating the program, mm -hmm. uh, we managed to establish 50 companies. So it looks like you're on track. More or less. Yes, we are. We are a hundred percent meeting all our KPIs and goals. Mm -hmm. And this year, um, our goal is to establish a hundred companies. 
and we are also on track to execute that goal this year. Okay, which I we pretty perfectly on track because that's one third of the thirty six months. That's great. Okay, so so lab lab is sort of your the the top of the funnel, the widest part. That's yes. attracting in the talent and the projects and so far twenty one hundred MVPs or whatever you want to call it, pre MVPs that come out of that. You selectively mm -hmm. analyze those. You, you see if the, any of them are maybe potentially good models. You offer your support in collaboration with the Saudi government. And if they take you up on it and you take them up on it, they move into, into Gaia. And Gaia that has is a specific correct. mandate from Saudi Arabia to see, what do you want to say, 300 companies over the next three years. And you're well on your way, it sounds like. That is that is 100% correct, yes. Okay. And the whole- Sometimes, sometimes I listen, sometimes. But, but the whole process is completely run by software. Right. So yes. uh, also the physical process and all the all the underlying um, interactions that happen between new native and the participants of the hackathons, the participants of the Gaia uh, program, they are all underwritten by AI systems that we as a software company built and develop to interact with our users. Right. So um, that's kind of the the big change is that the way that you build and operate software as a small team or mm -hmm. a bigger team is drastically changed thanks to the performance of AI systems and the, all the underlying and overarching technology innovation. So all the infrastructure innovation, all the data pipelines innovation that happened together with uh, the release of new AI systems uh, makes the building of products and companies, a completely different process, in my opinion, than it was even 12 or 24 months ago. So we call these companies AI native companies, right? Hence um, new native, yeah. Clever. Hence new native, right? Yeah. And therefore, when we have new technologies that come in, whether that's graph or there will be fractal models or there will be quantum computing coming in, and new native will incorporate those new technologies into the top of the funnel in order to uh, create innovative solutions and products on top of it. So our job, our job is to accelerate innovation. That means we always have to be on the tip of the spear. We're always the bleeding edge, yeah? And that's our job really, is to always be on the top of the innovation uh, curve and then hopefully work with great partners um, like Ian, like uh, partners in Saudi Arabia to be able to capture the value that's created by this process. Okay, so so th this is interesting, but it's a bit abstract. So let's walk through a real life case. Tell me about, mm. if you can, one of the companies that came to Lab Lab, won and was chosen, and then what's happening mm. to them now. So just step by step. Sure. And so what, have, uh... What's one of the companies you're working with? Sure. So let's say we have a group of researchers from um, uh, from Cambridge University mm -hmm. and ex uh, Google Brain uh, um, key employees, and they uh, come together to create their first prototype using the Lab Lab platform. So they sign up, yes, and they create the first prototype. They now you're talking about some flesh on it. Prototype of what? So in their case, they built a prototype of a large action model. The company name is now Agile Loop. Uh, think about it like you would automate any existing legacy software, right? Okay. So you have a, a old accounting system, like in the US, you have the old accounting systems, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, or the old banking systems. So think about that an AI, uh, uh, AI agent would start to operate it, manipulate it, almost like a car or a digger, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the system is able to manipulate the system with the proficiency of a human, but at a speed and repetitiveness of an AI, um, of an AI model. Sure. So they built such a prototype. And then- and so, they sorry, it's our, clear. They built that prototype during a 48 hour hackathon? That's right, yes. They proved wow. the concept in function, yeah? Okay. And then they entered into an online program um, into our online incubation for five weeks. And then after they finished the online incubation, we invited them to join the physical program in Saudi Arabia. 
and they finished as part of the first cohort. And now they're raising capital at an estimated valuation of about $80 million. Yeah? Sorry, one, so, one eight or eight zero? Eight zero. So that's not, that's not too shabby. No, not too shabby. And it's a process that took them a few months. Yeah, literally, I think six months, yeah, seven months to get from idea to this valuation. And when you think about that, is how different that process is from the normal way that people developed and built solutions, right? Um, so not only the timeline, but also the approach to uh, finding uh, people that will work with you, yeah? Getting talent into the um, company, uh, uh, getting access to resources and capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those things are fully driven by software and automation. Uh, and they ideally let the team uh, focus on what's important, which is building the innovative solution. Interesting. Now, the, the, if someone is working with Gaia and given your partnership with the Saudi government, are they mandated to set up their entity in Saudi Arabia? Yes, that's part of it. I mean, there's a, um, they are allowed to set up their entity. They can set up either the main headquarters and mm -hmm. convert their IP into Saudi, or they can set up a regional headquarters. Uh, we have a unique mandate because we can uh, help them set up the company without any cost. So they pay um, uh, just, I think, just the admin fees, which is like a few hundred dollars. Yes. And normally it requires massive capital to set up a company in Saudi. So one of the perks of the program is, hey, you enter Saudi uh, market basically without any cost, which is, I think, also important. But it's not really a main benefit that we focus on. Like we focus only on super deep tech founders. So people that really know how to build a functioning product and a functioning piece of software and have proven consistently that they can deliver updates and upgrades of this product. Right? Sure, but was like, what, what, what I was getting at is I'm listening to this, to this also from a political economy point of view, from mm -hmm. a Saudi point of view. And so they're, they're making, they're not, it's not just the operations or the team that's there, they're, they're forming sort of the corporate population, if you like, through this. I mean, you got three, at least 300 new companies there that are high tech that are actually formed there. And so, you know, yes. Saudi Arabia isn't is not internationally known as the place where you make companies, and they're 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 now beginning to maybe change that trend through the background, which is actually pretty smart. Um, uh, totally, totally, and not only companies because it's not a pizzeria; it's an advanced technology company that specializes in a, the most advanced technologies that are coming out in the world. They and they're not commercializing. One pizza in the beginning stole. For, I mean, stole sold for ten thousand Bitcoin. That's one of the first Bitcoin transactions ever. So, okay, yeah, crypto yeah, pizza are, are very close. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. That that pizza. Yeah. Well, the, the guy, the guy who sold the, his his pizza or something for the big, the guy who gave up his Bitcoin basically said he's dead inside. But <laughs> I, I, I don't blame him. So, what does it now? Suppose I'm, I'm this company. And I want to. I'm building my my company based on your platform or your techniques or your method. What day to day? What does that look like? What, what am I doing in the office? What am I touching? So, depending on whether you're in the online program, you would be attending slots, yeah, of sessions, and the, the AI, our AI system, will ping you for specific deliverables and KPIs, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you're in the communication channels and you are required to fill out specific um, documents and KPIs and deliverables. Plus, we track your code commitments. So we track your code documentation, your updates, your progression. Mm -hmm. And then we also have dedicated um, resources that support the founder in critical decisions, uh, in critical um, access to systems, compute, uh, very early stage kind of startup ecosystem tool set. So Sorry, that's pretty standard. Resources. I mean, they can escalate to a human? Yes. 
Okay. Yes, yes. There, there, there are not only our humans, but also humans from the one, some of the biggest AI companies in the world are also accessible to them. So normally, uh, because we guarantee the quality of the people that, uh, um, that these partners will interact with, yeah, mm -hmm. we guarantee that, hey, if they want to talk to you, these are really, really smart, young, motivated, driven people that want to use technology to solve a meaningful problem. So you should probably talk to them. Um, so that's number one. And then when you have a physical program, then uh, it's, it's mostly like any other accelerator. It, it has um, a number of uh, mentors, a number of workshops, and it basically allows people to go through certain gates. Yeah. And as they progress through the gates, their program and their um, product becomes much more mature yes. until it is culminated in a demo day. So very standard in terms of that process. The difference is that the focus of the process and the people that are inside the process are very much um, committed to AI founders and AI native companies. So it's a slightly different flavor of, of people and a slightly different flavor of founder that is inside such a program. And actually, now that I think about it, your, your domain, I believe, is newnative.ai. Is that right? Uh, that's, uh, yes, that's right, yes. Now, I'm appreciating it more. I thought it was, I thought it was just cute. But now, now you're at, you, it's, it's, it's actually your philosophy. It is. It is. Yeah. It's a philosophy of um, thinking how we built and operate software and companies and every domain of our life will undergo this drastic economical transformation. Which we're going to, we're going to touch on, because obviously part of this conversation is, is the promise and maybe threat of AI, but I, I want to get the full pipeline. So someone goes to, someone graduates in the Gaia, and yes. they work with you for a period of time. They get the AI mentorship or AI tracking and then the human involvement. You got this yes. one particular company that's raising capital at 80 million. So as I say, in this year, mashallah, congratulations. And, and then... I mean, maybe it's too early, but then what happens? So uh, ideally, we introduce um, the companies to investment partners that uh, we collaborate with. Yeah. So we uh, get the company's capital as well. Right. And that's probably been proven to be the most challenging because people still slightly it's changing right now. People don't understand how a group of two, three, six individuals in such a short time can create a fully functioning revenue generating product that requires very little capital to become um, uh, growth um, accelerated yeah so uh, we are so used in the past that you need half a million dollars to five million dollars to get to product market fit and a team of 12 to 20 engineers right that's no longer the case. As Sam Altman said, there's already companies that are built and that will be built that will have one person and a billion dollar valuation. Mm -hmm. So that's not an exaggeration. I believe that these companies are already on our platform. Yeah, I believe that these people are already building companies on lablab.ai. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that that's going to be a trend where uh, the whole industry will gravitate towards a decentralized grassroots innovation model because value will be found on that very early stage of development. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe now that the capital might not even be, be necessary. You, yeah? you, sorry, sorry, you anticipate my next question, which is if, if they're hitting revenue early yeah. without having yeah. to do this, maybe, maybe, I mean, sorry to say it, but maybe you need to rethink the need to raise capital. Or maybe you are rethinking yeah. it. That is completely correct. I believe that there's just the basic seed capital needed, like 100K per company. Yeah. And a lot of these companies will use that $100,000 to, um, to go 10x in their valuations. So mm -hmm. I believe that there's a whole AI native asset class that is being created. And that asset class will be underwritten with the value of the code. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like in any asset class, uh, there's a shift, you know, we fought nature-based assets, 
will never become an asset class. And now here we are, right? We fought Bitcoin as a great example or decentralized safe tokens or safe contracts will not be a tradable asset class. And here we are. Yeah. So I believe that we are witnessing the formation of a completely new asset class where individuals or small teams can create immense uh, profitability and value using a small amount of capital, but it has to be in an orchestrated system rather than completely disaggregated. Yeah. Sure. Um, so this also has a second impact, which I strongly believe in that is supported by data, is that there's a legacy software set. Yes. And you could read about it in the Wall Street Journal and you can look at the data from VC exits. So VC exits um, were down from 750 billion yeah, in 2021 um, to 70 billion in end of 2022. I need to look at the data from 23. Yeah, it's, it's, a, a nice, it's a little bit of a winter or at least a chill. It's, it's, correct. It's a, it's a no IPOs, no exits, complete. Uh, you know, this means that there was a write off, a write off. Mm -hmm. of hundreds of billions of dollars in portfolios. And the Wall Street Journal reports that this year, legacy software will lose $1.5 trillion in value. Yeah? So uh, I'll give you a tangible example. Uh, so Klarna, most recently, announced in collaboration with OpenAI the release of an autonomous agent that conducts customer support queries. Yeah? So it interacts with the customers, it takes the call, it talks, it does the first and second line of support. The work of that system is equivalent to 700 people. Uh, I saw that people. article, by the way. I know what you're talking about. So, so what is the immediate impact of such a switch? The company that I think was providing, if I'm not mistaken, the services for customer support to Klarna and is one of the biggest European customer support uh, companies lost in that day $1.5 billion of market capitalization. Mm -hmm. It should lose all of its market capitalization because that business, potent, very high probability, it, it doesn't need to exist. Yeah. And so it creates an opportunity to reskill, upskill, change the profile of the people working in that business. Right. Um, and, and that's something that they need to deal with. But just goes to show you that there's a legacy asset class and there's an AI native asset class. And, and there's also retooling the legacy for the AI. Correct. I mean, there's going to be two types of companies in the future, the ones that use AI and the ones that don't exist. Yeah. So it's a it's a mass extinction event. You know, it's like the comet hitting the dinosaurs and yes. uh, the dinosaurs didn't know that the comet is coming. They were, you know, very happy. Uh, you know, living their lives and then bam, uh, a few years later, uh, you know, we're here. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen with uh, with a lot of legacy software companies. Um, they will not have enough time to adopt to uh, this new reality. Interesting. Now, let, let me let me through this. Let, let's let's veer over into policy for a minute because I, I love I love what you're doing, but I want to I want to question some general trends. Um, I There's people who claim, maybe you're one of them, that all these workers who are going to lose their jobs because they've been replaced by AI will learn to code. Of course, coding won't be a skill anymore, but that was the thing. You know, your industry's failing, learn to code. Come on, get with it. Now, of course, you got Devin, which is learning to code for you. I am not convinced that there's enough smart, young, adaptable humans out there of a, as a proportion of the whole group that can make the switch. I I think we got an aging population. I think we got all, we got a screwed up educational system. I am not convinced that people are so nimble or that they're willing to be. And I think we're gonna end up with a class of un, unemployed and unemployable and non-retrainable people. And I have in my mind, I, you know, I'm. I'm partially German. I remember when Germany reunified and they, they made the decision that people over 55, they wouldn't bother retraining from Eastern Germany. They're like, they're too old to retrain. We're just going to retire to them. 
And because it's Germany and they had the resources, it wasn't the end of the world for them. But they're, they're, you know, there's, there's a cost of retraining people and not everyone can do it. And the, the, the jobs that AI, are, are AI is replacing are so, you know, they're the bottom tier and the middle tier. And so you're going to need people who can jump directly to the top tier. That's tough without working through the bottom. So are you quite so comfortable and confident with the ability of people to exist? It's a, it's a very tough question. I think um, using your uh, using an analogy, I think there there is a rising tide, yeah, and it's gonna be lifting boats. And even if you're in a leaky boat, if the tide rises for most everybody, we will we will we will swim higher. Right, we will have a better view of of uh, of the higher that's ground. Like, oh, I gotta stop you. That's a that's a nice visual, okay. But but in, in practical terms, if someone is at the company you just mentioned and they're a customer yeah. service person, so you know they maybe have some language and skills and sales training, but they're probably not technical. But what, what, what do they, think... you know, how does their boat rise exactly? So the hey man, but wait, I'm not the... saying it should. Okay, change happens. No, but... Okay, but it, just walk me through it. I get it. I get it. I think there's going to be more, as you said, I agree with you. There's not enough people to handle the jobs that will come. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we're not going to experience a job loss. We're going to experience a job shortage. It's just going to be different jobs in different places, different locations for different skill sets and um, very likely for different people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the displacement will be in the hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, the displacement. Yes. Sure. But the opportunity will also be in the hundreds of millions. Now, uh, uh, is... sorry, are you sure? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm pretty I, sure. I can't that... wait to hear this. Go, go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, we will experience overall a growth of prosperity for the individual. And then obviously there will be people that will not be able to uh, catch up fast enough. Yeah. And I think that's in the national government interests to create social safety nets, to um, not allow drastic uh, poverty or drastic uh, collapse of social economical um, uh, structures. Right. Sure. And, and, but that is a huge challenge, and uh, for sure, for sure, I'm not part of that conversation yet. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to bring everybody up to a level, and I think that's kind of my mission is for everybody to join. Mm -hmm. um, but I totally agree that there should be a discourse at the national government level about bringing um, policies in place that will already start to counteract the uh, the fallout yeah because there will be there will be uh, changes to handle no question about that right um, and, and they're going to come fast and they're going to come and and this is kind of i think this is the biggest problem is that we've never experienced such drastic changes in such a uh, rapid uh, pace but what i think what creates real real social unrest and creates real dilemma mm. is the increase of, uh, of inequality in societies. So the societies that experience increased inequality mm. um, then experience also social economic unrest, misery, suffering, you know, the lack of fairness, the lack of the ability to build out a better outcome for a bigger group of people, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the job behind us, that's part of our mission at New Native is to give that equal opportunity. So nobody can guarantee uh, equality of outcome, yeah? Uh, so we- <laughs> Some people are we, trying to. No, but that's, that's, you know, I think we, I think majority of people agree that that's a, that's a failed idea. But the point is, at least let's provide a uh, somewhat equal opportunity. And I think what we've experienced in the past is when such big economical shifts happen, we experience a centralization of decision-making and power. Yeah, Whether that was 
Silicon Valley and the internet uh, revolution, the mobile revolution, the industrial revolutions. Um, and the reason for that is that the distribution of access wasn't instant. The proliferation of this technology came from physical limitations. Not everybody had access to infrastructure, internet, devices, sure. computers, transistors, mobile devices, uh, app building SDKs. Versus today, we can't really say that, uh, um, I mean, th there's very few societies that have systemically limited access to participate in the AI revolution. Very few societies, yeah? So Compared it, to what it, we call it is accessible. Degrees it is of accessible. It. Sure. And this is what this is the mission that we're after is to make it accessible, create an on-ramp for people to have millions of people to join this uh, change. And maybe it will not create the outsized economical returns for 10 individuals like it did in the past. Yes, because that's what we have right now. We have 10 individuals or 20 individuals in the world that have the complete outsized economical uh, return of mm -hmm. these uh, changes. Uh, but I hope it will allow people to participate in a greater way um, on their local level and on a global level. Yeah. I Can I jump in for a second? Yeah. I hope you're right. I, I feel, hope I, I'm I, right. I, I feel that you're not. And, and by, by the way, this has nothing to do with your business model, which I think is amazing. I, yeah. Now we're shifting the conversation to AI in general. And by the way, I, I don't think I don't think we can hold back the flood. It's going to happen. Mm. It's like the it's dinosaurs in the comments. You can have an opinion about the comment, but the, the comment doesn't care. The comment or the asteroid, it, it is it is coming. In fact, it's already in the upper atmosphere. So you just you know kiss your kiss your Tyrannosaurus Rex goodbye and go find a man. Correct. You know yes. it, it is. What you can it is. see you can see the star getting bigger. You're like, oh, you know, oh, look, pretty star. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, 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 I am of the opinion that, you know, everything you're saying about, even if you don't have a democracy, you somehow need the consent, the, con the consent or the acquiescence of the population. You at least need the, the military and the police to be on your side and some classes of civil society. But I, I think with robots and AI, the requirement for that is going to drop a lot. Because the monopoly on force can become robots, and you get something like China, where you can, where you have algorithmic sentiment management, and you know, pre, you know, and, or minority report, which is preemptive prevention of mm -hmm. certain things, and you know, and with brain scanning technology and facial recognition and sentiment analysis and mm -hmm. metadata analysis on it, and the, the fact that they can have now, you know, extremely shortly, if not now. Humanoid robots mm -hmm. on the street be able to do stuff that will basically have law enforcement powers. I'm, I'm, I'm. I think we're heading towards an oligarchic dystopia, and you know, there's that Theodore Kaczynski thing uh, of what do you do with excess humans? I mean, because they're just so, they're literally all just going to be consumers. If they so AI robots will produce better than we can, so so I my my personal opinion about this not not being 20 years old. But not being in a wheelchair is, you know, th this is the Red Queen scenario where I, I need to run as fast as I can just to stay in place, and so does everyone else because you know we're in this we're we're in the same arms race we've been in for all of human existence, which is, you know, things are changing fast, and if you you need to adapt, and not everyone can adapt, and so you know there's universal. The, 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 also, the problem is suppose we do put social controls in place or social uh, benefits in place, like universal basic income. The, the problem is that when you have industry and economy divorced from labor, that industry and economy becomes extremely mobile. Okay, AI can, like to your point, AI can go anywhere. So companies used to not leave Germany because Germany had Germans. You know, you had a great workforce. You know, the, you had rational unions, you had a favorable environment, all that other stuff. But as things get automated and as things get AI, you know, you don't need the Germans anymore. You can set up the same thing in, or just, I'm choosing a random country without being negative, in Burma or Myanmar, because as long as you have a port and, you're, and your robots are working, who cares if you're not in Hamburg? So, so I, don't, I don't know, bro. <laughs> I, I think that we then have to decide 
whether we will compromise our core value system mm -hmm. in order to have unlimited, unbound economic discrepancy for selected individuals. Yeah. And I think that is a question that societies will ask and politicians will ask, not for me. Um, but I think that you have to have people with a strong uh, moral authority to lead those conversations, to be able to say, hey, we're not going to make some decisions or we're going to make decisions that are beneficial for us as a, as a species. And a great example is uh, smoking. Smoking is an amazing example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we collectively decided that it, it's time to, let's say, uh, control and regulate it. And it was the same for uh, alcohol for children. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's the same for, I believe now there's a big trend in social media for children. Yeah, We're going to look back in 20 years and we're going to look at it and say, you and I are going to be sitting there like, oh my God, 20 years ago, I can't believe we let kids on social media. Can you imagine that you saw a child on Instagram or TikTok on a plane? That's really it's interesting. Gonna be like a, it's going to be like a child smoking on an aeroplane. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, you saw that in the, yeah, but that yeah. was in the 60s. Yeah, you had a 16, you, you had a teenager smoking on an airplane, no problem. Yeah, yeah well, what's but that doesn't happen. <laughs> yes, no, no, but, but we, we know that we evolved our norms, standards, because we kept true to uh, core values and a moral authority of making decisions. Is that true for every country? Of course not. Of course not. Is that the same uh, compass that guides every culture? No, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, um, But at least we have to have the upper hand as uh, you know, as where we believe, um, we maybe not have the right, but at least we have the uh, the common decency, yeah, to act towards each other like we would like to uh, see others treat us at the very least, yes. So I think if we look at AI, that is a big challenge because we just have to make sure that these systems are in the hands of people that uh, that have their best interest, not only their best interest in mind, but also their local community's best interest and their family's best interest and their um, and their uh, uh, and the best interest of what surrounds them. And I think that's the real reason that it needs to be democratized. Yes? Yeah, it's amazing. Because... You, I'm sure you're familiar, more familiar than I am with the alignment challenge with the AI. How do, how do you get the I, AI doing what you want it to do, not deceiving you, not literally interpreting you like some evil genie, but knowing what you meant and doing it. Mm -hmm. And now, now there's actually, now that I'm thinking about it, and you raised the good, great point, there's actually a double alignment issue, which is we need the humans that are controlling AI, AI to have also their want alignment to... right with the of rest course. of humanity. So you have to align the yeah. AI with the human and the human needs to be aligned with humanity. Because if the AI is lined to the human, but the human's evil, now you got a real problem. So, <laughs> so as you said, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, no, there's no like controlling this. There's no regulating this. So my solution is, let's run together to the doors. Yeah, but together. Yeah, let's run to the Star Trek doors mm -hmm. together. Let's get that better outcome, but for as many of us as possible, and. And then maybe we don't have to be so afraid of uh, what's going to happen in the future. Maybe we can be uh, happy that people are solving big problems for humanity using technology. And uh, other people are happy to be, uh, to be working on other things in agriculture or in manufacturing or in art and craft and creation and philosophy. And, uh, and we evolve, yeah? Because the last... What 150 years is the um, revo the, the, the mechanical revolution. revolution? Yes, uh, let's call it like that. Um, so is that is that the final frontier? Is that it? We, no. we peaked. <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah. So so where's the peak? Let's find out. 
let's go, let's let's find out, let's innovate, let's accelerate the process before we uh, obliterate ourselves uh, collectively. Yeah. So but that, that's actually a very interesting answer because we're like there's that famous time. formula and I forget the name of it of why we seem to be alone in the universe and there's it, the, the idea is that a majority of civilizations have a technological self destruction a technological suicide mm -hmm. before they get all the way to the stability I forget the name of this thing I'll, I'll find it maybe put it in the show notes but I like your solution which is let's grow let's grow up let's yeah. be, let's, be, let's become you know adequate adequate as a species fast so that fast. we can manage this stuff and enjoy the benefits of of it that's a, that's a very positive take on it that, that i like i mean it's it's not just a take because i'm just actually doing something about it so it's not an opinion i don't have an opinion i'm i have a i have, have a commercial action. enterprise i have a commercial enterprise which goal is to achieve that better outcome so uh kind of that's my approach to it is that then you need to organize people around this idea and champion this idea to a conclusion. It's you not know what, that's highly respectable. Thing. And Pavel, I want to invite you to an iftar here on April 5th to talk to a crowd of, of elite investors and other people and share your vision for humanity achieving a adequate and awesome outcome through what you're doing. I, it's a pleasure and I, it will be a pleasure to attend. So, uh, I will. I will see you on the fifth of April. Fantastic. Okay, I, we're going to end on that note because you know you you saved the show. You 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 stopped me from jumping out the window. I, I'll I'll work with AI. I'll, I'll make it happen. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs> that was that was that was a great interview. Good job. One second. Thank you.